Okay, everybody, welcome back to another Monday. And uh, we are, we only have like three or four Mondays left, I think, before the end, actually. Uh, we have, let's just take a look at the calendar real quick, actually, while I'm here. Um, it is uh, the end, the, oh, yes, we have, uh, we have like one week in, we in one week after this. My, my house time, have time has flown. So I'm going to go through a lot of memory today, and um, we're going to have a lecture on the 12th as well. So we have today and we have the 12th. The 12th I'll review for the final. The final will be on the 19th, if you like to take it on the 19th. If you don't want to take it on the 19th, it will be offered on the 21st as well. I don't have the hours yet. In fact, maybe I'll have them for next week. That's what I'm hoping. Or maybe I'll send an email message out to the class to let you know what the hours are going to be. Probably going to be in the morning. Um, I was going to say probably around 10 or 11 to 2 or to, or to 1 or to something of that nature so that we can... Um, get it all over with in the morning. You don't have to take it on the 21st if you want to take both exams. If you're in both classes of mine, you can take them both on the 19th if you want. It's just an option for those people um, who are in both classes. Or as someone pointed out, if you're just in one of the classes and you don't want to take it on Monday, you want to take it on Wednesday, that's fine too. So You just have to get it done on one of those two days. We are going to have a lecture next week. I'm going to need it. We will have both. We will have a lecture and then we'll have a review lecture. So we'll go for um, both, because um, I have to review for the final. So The final right now is multiple choice. I have it about half written right now. It's multiple choice. Um, it is covering, obviously, um, out, well, through memory so far. Um, I don't think I'm going to put anything um, really significant on the later part. It's going to be mostly on the front part of the course. So CPU scheduling, memory. Uh, processes. Uh, we actually covered a lot so far. Um, well, we're almost through. We're almost through all the material. Um, we are actually working on uh, lecture eight to nine A and nine B today as well. Um, so if you take a look at the, um, if if you are following along, you don't have the book and you're using the lectures. If you follow along with the um, uh, powerpoints here, we're about right here. So we do have a little bit to finish up. I don't normally get to twelve and thirteen. So I normally get, just get through 11, actually. So we're on we're put, we're really good timing, actually. So we're right on schedule. So, All right, so last time I started memory management. So today I'd like to finish Chapter 8, uh, which is on main memory. And I looked at the, uh, or started looking at the structure of the page table uh, last time. And it stopped about here. So we have different types of page tables. So, so just so that you know, the page table keeps track of the different pages of memory that are being mapped to frames. So we have frames inside of the pages. The frames are working towards the physical abstraction. So the farther we go away from the page table to the physical memory, we get more of the true resolution or the, or the true translation of what exact physical location we're actually looking at. The page table is just nothing more than a mechanism, a data structure, to keep track of which pages and which frames are inside of which pages, which pages are free, what programs are being used inside of each one of the pages, or what pages are assigned to different programs, process spaces, and stuff like that. So we have hierarchical pages, hash page tables, and inverted page tables. So a hierarchical page table is broken up so that we have the logical spaces that are inside of multiple page tables. We just basically, instead of having one page table, we have many. And we nest them inside of each other. So we have a page table inside of a page table inside of a page table, which is actually kind of odd when you think about it, but it sort of works. The concept is that we want to make this run as fast as possible. So first of all, we're working with the speed of the memory. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's farther away from the CPU than the cache memory or the register. So it is, you know, I don't want to call it slow, but it's slower than what it could be. So we have to optimize our read and our writes to the memory. Don't take something out of memory if we need it. Um, make sure that when we want to go find something to put it back into memory, we can go find it quickly, um, which is why we play around with all these different configurations for these page tables so that we can figure out, well, how are we going to find it? So if you've taken a data structures and an algorithms course, you know that the algorithms are generally um, optimized to work with the different data structures. Data structures are important because we need to pick the right type of format, the right you know scheme to put this page table in to make it navigational or to make it efficient in terms of the algorithm that we're going to use to go search for something. 
So in a hierarchical one, we're basically lowering the search space. If we have a bigger page table and we go, okay, well, let's go into the smaller one, smaller one, smaller one, we can navigate quickly through different levels to get to a point where we find something that only has like 10, 10 things that we have to go through or 20 things that we have to go through. It makes the search space smaller, makes it more efficient from an algorithm perspective. So it's a simple technique. A, a simple one is a two-level page table. And here's an example of a two-level page table scheme. Now, if you were to ask me what a modern-day operating systems do these days, nested hierarchical page tables. And then each process may end up with its own page table eventually. But it's going to be nested inside of a bigger one, inside of a bigger one, inside of a bigger one. Um, because it makes it, well, not only easier to, to find, but easier to translate in the end. And it may, it's basically less prone to errors as well. So it's a little bit more efficient and also a little bit more airproof. So here's an outer page table. Inside of the outer page table, we have the inner page tables, and the inner page tables are nothing more than the same abstraction. And it's all mapped to physical memory. And here's the memory over here. This is physical memory, by the way. And these are the page pages that are mapped to the different locations that we're looking at. <clears throat> so a two-level paging example, we have the logical addresses, um, again, that are mapped to physical ones. They're divided into page numbers and then page offsets, just like the main page table. Now, on a final exam, I'm not going to ask you about these numbers or the offsets or how big they are, because it's going to depend on the operating system you're actually working with and how, how many bytes you're going to set for the page. And it depends also on your memory abstraction, too. Bigger byte systems are probably going to use something a little bit bigger than this. If you have more, um, more addressing or higher level addressing, you're going to have different configurations. So I'm not going to ask you... Um, there's no math on the, uh, no math, no calculations, not even for the CPU schedulers. Um, you don't have to calculate any shortest, any average wait times or anything like that. Um, so, But just in case you're curious of how this does get configured, you're looking at a starting address and then an offset, and then a starting address and an offset. Because why keep both? When you know how big the offset is and you can set it to a standard um, size, then you just find the starting address of where you're looking for. You go to that standard size, and then you don't have to keep the information. You can just use it. So here's an address translation scheme, which is basically what I've been kind of talking about here, where we have the logical addresses, and then we have the offset. <coughs> and we're basically just going from outer page to inner page to inner page to find the memory address we're interested in, and applying the offset, and then we're finding the location that uh, of whatever piece of information we're trying to bring in or pull out of memory. So, so that was a two-level. Well, we can take it a bit uh, further and go through a three-level paging scheme. Actually, you can go as many depths as you want with this. Outer and inner and offset. And here's a second outer, another outer, and inner and offset. <coughs> so we're just adding another page table out outside of it. So hash page tables um, are basically a data structure that's a little bit more optimized. It's common for addressing schemes that are larger than 32 bits because if we have a larger addressing schemes and more of them, we're going to need to make this algorithm a bit more optimal. So the virtual page number is hashed into the page table, and then the table contains a chain of elements hashing to the same location. And the virtual page numbers are compared to the chain searching for the match, and then if a match is found, the corresponding physical frame is extended, which is the concept of the page table translation to begin with. So. And here's an example of a little hash page table scheme. It's just nothing more than a different structure that we're holding the page table in, and a hash is a sort of, think of it sort of like a dictionary lookup versus a flat, flat like an Excel spreadsheet of columns of data. We have a lookup mechanism that we're going to add in there to do a faster translation. So, Inverted page tables. I don't normally even cover inverted page tables when I go over this chapter. In fact, you can stop before hash page tables. There's not going to be any questions on the final on hash page tables or inverted page tables. But the page table concept is important, in the, knowing that you can uh, create hierarchies of page tables. Also kind of an important concept as well. But I'm going to skip through this inverted page table and go on to segmentation. So in terms of the information, don't worry about hash, don't worry about inverted. You can skip those parts of the chapter if you're reading it as well. 
because those concepts have changed significantly. <laughs> and the book's actually a bit outdated. It's based on older models. So, mm, newer stuff. Well, think about it as, as architectures grow, as technology is increasing, we're basically being a little bit more inventive when it comes to managing that memory. So, I do want to talk about segmentation because that's a concept you want to be familiar with. Um, it's the programmer's view of memory. It's taking the program and breaking it off into smaller segments. So instead of viewing the memory as pages and frames like the operator's operating system would, if you break the memory out into program segments, then you can have DLL files, shared objects, operating system libraries and things that are all stored in memory in terms of segments, and then you're linking the segments together, which is basically what segmentation is about. So the well, let's see the textbook definition of it here. Let's see if that makes any sense. Memory management scheme that supports the user's view of memory. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what uh, basically the the description I gave you a few minutes ago is probably a little bit more detailed with that. But yeah, it's uh, it's the programmer's view. Um, is it the programmer's view or the user's view? Well, it's both actually. So as a programmer, you usually think of the shared libraries actually as segments. So this program is a collection of segments, and so the segment is the logical unit. So we have the main program, procedures, functions, methods, objects. You really want to kind of narrow down the concept of segmentation. Think of object orientation these days, and think of Java, actually. Uh, the Java JVM uses a segmentation concept where we have different objects that are loaded up into memory, and then the, our main program memory is linking to those objects in memory. So they're really referred to a segment, so it's a segmentation scheme. So how are you going to organize the segments? How are you going to um, utilize all the capabilities of the JVM to link to those segments and things of that nature? Probably going to do it mostly dynamic, which is what Java does. Um, that's all in the concept of segmentation, in terms of the concept. It can be done in a Windows operating system. It can be done stack allocated as well. It doesn't have to be done dynamically, and it doesn't have to be done only in Java. So segmentation is a concept that spans multiple different types of operating systems and environments. So here's the user's view of the program, where we have the subroutine, a stack, a symbol table, main program. Here's a function, so a square root function out here. Just think of each one of the program units. Um, well, if those people are familiar with make files from the old days <laughs> when we had .o files that came out of it, object code, and we linked the object code together. Well, that's linking the segmentations together. But if we don't want to link them all into one file, we can put them all into memory, scatter them out all over, and then use a segmentation scheme to organize them to, to, so we can find all the program units that belong to the same program. And here's the contrast here. So here's the user space and the segmentation in terms of the abstraction. And then here's the physical memory. So we have this, is this memory address, that one's over here, and this one, number three, is over here. And they're different sizes. So segmentation actually can be um, make more efficient use because we're not going to, well, hopefully we'll be eliminating internal fragmentation because we only reserve the amount of memory that we need. And then we register the address and say, here it is, here it is, here it is. Well, what are we going to get with that? We're going to get contiguous memory allocation issues. So we'll have to worry about spaces and external fragmentation that might go along with that. So, so a segmenta segmentation architecture is the key in terms of making the abstraction work if you're going to take this approach. And so it's very similar to main memory and page tables. We have a segment table. Once the segment table, then it's going to map the two-dimensional physical addresses with a base and a limit. Same thing as the page table. So segmentation table and page table are very similar in concept. Um, the only thing different is essentially how big are we going to make the segments versus the pages, and um, you know what um, what length, and then how are we going to resolve lookups. So segmentation-based registers point to the segment tables location and memory, and then we have a length register that keeps track of, well, how big is this? And then we find the following, we find the final address, so we can uh, figure out basically um, how big is the memory, and then how, where, where are we going to find it, and then what we're going to use it for, or what are we going to use it, how much of it we're going to bring into memory to identify.
Um, pro common problems with segmentation architecture not mentioned in the slide, but probably mentioned in the book if you read through the chapter, is um, using the proper address resolution scheme and making sure that, um, well, following, following through an efficient scheme to make better use of the memory. Because all the problems that are associated with segmentation are the same as contiguous memory allocation, which is con similar to other memory management problems, where we want to try to eliminate external and internal fragmentation. And then we want to make better use of all of the addresses so that we um, don't have anything that is inaccessible or that we can't use. And then also we're making sure that when we're reading something, it actually does belong to the process that uh, it's, it's supposed to be mapped to. So we have this thing called a protection bit, essentially saying whether it's valid or invalid, whether it's being written, has it been read, has it not been read. Uh, so it's usually one of the page entries in the segment table. We have a valid bit, or is it illegal? Valid, basically valid, invalid, is, this, is it being used by this process? Does it belong to this process? And then they have a thing, it's not on the slide, but usually they refer to it as a dirty bit, which means has the data changed? Because if you're going to do memory swapping and nothing has changed, with that memory. You just loaded it up, you read it, you put it up into memory and it just sat there. And there's no reason, there's no dirty bit set on it, which means it hasn't changed. And there's no reason to write it back out, just get rid of it. So you can save some extra time, computational time, or CPU time I should say, in not having to write it to a backing store, because it didn't change. I don't have to save anything. Um, so you can use a little bit, so in the bits normally end up in the page tables or the segmentation tables, and they indicate whether or not we have to do something to that piece of memory or not. So protection bit associates with segments, code sharing, which occurs. So when we talk about segmentation, we're really, um, to one point, um, actually trying to make use of um, sharing memory between multiple different processes so we can mark the location or the segment as shareable or not shareable um, because we have program segments out there and um, if you want to think about this as you know DLLs you can actually think of it like a DLL and um, what's the sense of a dynamically linked library when you can't link it so you put a bit on it that says hey I'm shareable which means people can link to me they may not be able to change it in fact most of them are read only because DLL doesn't change so a DLL is going to be like a driver, or it's going to be some program code segment that's out there for some utility, a print driver, hardware-related driver, or interface. And so when we link to it, we're just using a service that this object is providing us. Um, and so if we make it shareable, then we can uh, have privileges to read it if we're another program. So since segments also vary in length, the memory allocation is dynamically stored. We can't predetermine at compile time, and we can't predetermine how big of a space we're going to need. And as I was mentioning before, we can have different segments. When we put together pages, we use paging versus segmentation. Segmentation is generally variable, various different sizes of segments. And we have to keep track of, are they readable? Are they dirty? Have they changed? Um, are they valid, invalid? On a page table, we can actually keep the same type of information. But generally what ends up happening is we have so many frames that are assigned to so many pages and each page is predefined statically ahead of time when it's going to be allocated. And we're taking those pages and we're allocating them to the process needs. So, and we're probably end up, if we're the modern day operating system, setting the same amount of memory per process. So if the process needs X amount of memory, it's going to get so many amounts of pages and so many amounts of pages have a fixed amount of frames. We have both external and internal fragmentation that might exist, but we reduce the external fragmentation by keeping page tables and using non-contiguous memory locations. So we can fill in different frames anywhere we want to map to different pages. We take the pages, any, any combination of any pages that are free, give it to a process. It makes better efficient use of the memory. If you do that with segments, the only problem is you have to figure out, well, how big do we need it? Because <laughs> they're various different sizes. And so we're not really, it's, the concept's different. We're not really thinking it more like a bunch of pages that are mapped to a process or to a memory or frames inside of those pages. We're mostly thinking about memory blocks from a starting location, then an offset. This memory belongs to this object. We stamp a label on it. We call it the print object or something, and that just sits out there. 
So it's a little bit easier in terms of the abstraction, but it's a little less efficient because you could lead to some external fragmentation with that. If you're using a segmentation approach with the page table and paging at the same time, then you're probably implementing your segmentation uh, as an outermost page table, and then you're going in and you're resolving to pages eventually. So long story short, if your Windows, <laughs> if your Unix, um, Linux, you know, mo mo you're using pages. You're not using segmentation. Segmentation is kind of it was thought of more. If you're Java, you're doing segmentation. Uh, but if you're another operating system, you're doing pages. And then if you think you're doing segmentation, it's really an abstraction on top of your pages that you're working with. Uh, Java utilizes segmentation, however, so I shouldn't say everybody does. A segmentation example shown in the following diagram. The next diagram here we get a segmentation example. These examples that are in the textbook I don't think are the clearest. They're kind of um, convoluted. Makes everything look like, well, this is the segmentation hardware if we have support for it. Just the same way as we can put a page table in hardware and we can have hardware support to um, help speed up and or better organize the lookup through the page tables, we can do the same thing with segmentation tables. So. You don't actually have to know anything about hardware for this course either. No questions on the final about hardware, hardware implementation, anything. Uh, because it's really specific towards the vendor of the hardware who's making the operating system. Um, so you're not going to know it unless uh, you work with a particular operating system. And another theme for the final is that there's no questions on any particular operating system. <laughs> so if I can't ask you questions on particular operating systems, I can't ask you questions on hardware either. It doesn't work that way. So it doesn't work well. Here's an example of segmentation. So if I were to put the pieces together and kind of show you, if we're still looking at a segmentation table, we could very well call it a page table. We still have a translation lookup. So the concept is very similar. It's just a different abstraction. Um, some textbooks actually talk about segmentation. Some don't because it's very particular to the implementation. Um, so, uh, so subroutine stack, symbol table, that is, there's a segment table here. And the segment table is resolved to here. And the interesting thing is you have different size segments. So, so you can have different size segments where you don't normally have different size segments with a, with a page table. It's all usually about the same size pages. So here's some examples, and then as I mentioned before, you don't need to know these examples. But if you're curious, the Intel Pentium supports both segmentation and segmentation with paging. As I mentioned before, if we have a paging-based operating system, <laughs> we're going to support it with paging because it's going the segmentation abstraction is going to ride on top of it. Um, the CPU generates logical addresses. Linear addresses are then uh, given to page units, and then we we address everything down to pages. Let's see. Until, until paging. Uh, linear addressing in Linux also supports paging, by the way. Here's our three level paging in Linux. Linux are primarily paging systems. So, and there's nothing in here on Java. So, this is the older slide set. I believe the author put something in on Java actually in chapter 8. You don't have to know anything about any of the particular operating systems, by the way. So, so that, was, uh, that was the end of chapter 8, so we're going to move to chapter 9, and you're going to go, well, what's the difference between chapter 8 and chapter 9? One of them is called main memory, the other one's called virtual memory. <laughs> and then people are going to go, well, how does that differ from logical memory? Hmm. Well, interesting abstractions. Uh, so everyone can pretty much conceptualize, and I just want to kind of review, just just take a moment here so you understand what this chapter is about, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> physical memory. Those are the boards we're putting on the computer. It gets turned into logical memory when we shove it through an MMU, and we make a logical abstraction of that physical. Why do we need logical? Because we need to have some sort of a mapping scheme that's consistent among all different computer systems. Otherwise, we can't read all those addresses that come out of those physical things. You know how many vendors there are that make memory? They're all different. They're all mapped differently. There's so many different chips, you know. Long story short, we make a logical representation out of it. 
and then we try to use it as main memory so the programmer or the operating system developer doesn't call it logical they call it main oh, what's main well that goes back to primary memory but they don't call it primary anymore it was primary and secondary most people remember secondary because they still use that term occasionally that's your hard drive your USB drives your long-term memory that doesn't go away it's permanent. Well, it's supposed to be permanent. <laughs> so that's secondary. Well, if it's not secondary, it's primary. Well, it's primary. Well, then that, people didn't like that word. They called it main memory. And they went, okay, main memory. That's the memory we have to use that's an abstraction of the logical that's available to us that the MMU made out of the physical. So you can think of a hierarchy, put physical on the bottom, put logical on top of that, put main on top of that, and then let's put virtual on top of main. <laughs> so most people get confused well what do you mean by virtual and what do you mean by main main is just the memory it's just the page tables with the frames and how we're going to use that logical address space so main is just an abstraction of the logical address space virtual memory we take the logical we take the main memory and we turn it into something that it's not why because we need to make it bigger so virtual memory doesn't really exist, as the word might actually imply. It's virtual. Well, does main memory exist? It does, sort of. Main is not virtual. It does actually exist. It's an abstraction made on top of the logical. Virtual takes the main, makes it bigger. So we have a lot more stuff going on. So what do we get with virtual memory? When we talk about virtual memory, we take 2 gigs of RAM and we turn it into 4 gigs by making something that doesn't exist to complement it, to double its size, triple its size. Well, if we're going to triple its size at any one moment of time, we have half of it or a third of it, <laughs> depending upon how we tripled it or doubled it. If we doubled it, we only have half of it really there. So virtual memory talks about all of the page replacement algorithms. All of the, because we've got to do is, because you got this virtual concept of twice as much memory as you really have, we have to swap something out, put something back in. So we have swapping, thrashing, paging, demand paging. Demand paging is, well, let's just bring it in when we need it. Why bring it in when we don't need it? So demand paging is what I'm going to talk about. Copy and write, not copying. Well, that's the dirty bit that's, that's kept to see. Do we need to do anything? Page replacement algorithms. Picking a victim, pulling something out of memory, put something back into memory. Imagine you got all this virtual memory and you're stuffing it into physical memory. You've got 20 banks on the virtual and you've got 5 banks on the physical. Well, you can only at one time, you can only have 5 things running at one time, but you got all this other stuff loaded. So there's a lot of swapping, there's a lot of um, orchestrating, there's a lot of moving stuff around. So I'm going to talk about the concept of thrashing. Thrashing is when we don't have enough memory. We only have five banks, but we need six. So we keep pulling stuff out, putting something, pulling something out, putting something in. You're spending all your time taking stuff out, putting stuff in, taking stuff out, reorganizing everything, but it won't all fit. It's kind of like how people try to pack their cars up. Or, you know, a moving truck. Trying to pack. But the moving truck is full. So you spend all the time pulling stuff out, putting stuff back in, pulling stuff out, pulling. But you don't go anywhere. That's thrashing. <laughs> So the memory on the computer does the same thing. When you were asking for all this, but we don't have the physical storage space, so we keep reorganizing everything so that we can figure out how we're going to put it all in, but it won't all fit. So what the memory should be doing is taking the truck over, unloading it, and then coming back with an empty truck. <laughs> we're throwing away some of the stuff out of memory and not trying to keep it. <laughs> so that's the trip to the Goodwill or whatever it is, the donation center when you're moving. Okay, so the allocation for the kernel memory and then other considerations and then operating system examples. Well, I'm going to skip through the operating system examples because we don't need that. So, let's describe the benefits of virtual memory system and then we'll explain paging, page replacement, and then discuss the printing working model set. So, so here's your textbook definition of virtual memory. So I gave you the, the other one with the hierarchy that was associated with. Let's see what the textbook says. is the separation of the user logical memory from the physical memory. <laughs> it doesn't really say it very well. I don't know. So it's the only part of the program that needs to be in memory for execution. Well, all right. So 
don't look at that one. If you like my other one that I gave you a few minutes ago, if you like that one better, I think that one's a better one. Because, you know, I even think of virtual, because I'm going to ask you on the, on the final and say, what's the difference between main memory and virtual memory? I think, well, main memory is an abstraction of the logical. The virtual is taking that main and doubling or tripling, making it bigger, making it, making it like so it can actually be more efficient for the use of the operating system. So actually, there's a lot of theory that goes into how big should the virtual memory be. And there's different calculations, actually, because you can create virtual memory. The user actually can add to its virtual memory space by um, creating cache, using cache systems for it, and by creating things like swap drives and stuff. So the old Linux systems had the swap drive concept, which made your virtual memory bigger. So. So it, made, it gave you a basic, and RAM disks, anybody remember the RAM disk concept? You can actually take and create like a hard drive secondary memory in memory, which was actually kind of interesting, but it used your main memory, so the RAM disk was actually kind of the opposite. It decreased your virtual memory because it made hard drive memory, secondary memory, in the first, first primary memory, which was kind of odd. But people did that because the hard drives weren't big enough. <laughs> you had five floppies. You had to put it in there. You made a RAM disk, loaded it up into the the virtual disk. Well, that's virtual. That is really the definition of virtual memory. It's a concept of an abstraction that's made for memory usage. So that's virtual memory applied to RAM disk or secondary. So that RAM disk was a technique to create virtual memory of secondary storage. So you don't have to actually look at the physical storage of it, the disk. It's already in memory. We actually have caching systems that create more virtual memory for us. Which, but cache is kind of like, well, let's put in faster chips closer to the CPU than the main memory is. And then instead of pulling it way out, let's just put it on the side for a second. So we have, fill up the cache first. So we have now another layer. So the CPU needs something. They're going to use the red. The CPU uses the registers. So it's going to load something, read back and forth through the registers. Registers are very small. They're not going to store that much. So they're going to put stuff in main memory. If you're not using it in main memory, but you're going to use it next, you know it's coming up. Your program is going to use it. Then you cache it because you got to pull it out of the main memory because your virtual abstraction of that main memory is filled up completely. So now you got to pull it out and you got to put it somewhere where cache is sort of like the holding ground. Stick it in the cache memory. Refresh the cache. If you haven't used it, then throw it away. Take it out. Put it on the backing store. Get out of it. You know, make room for something else. But the idea was, why take it all the way to the backing store and then bring it all the way back in when you just need it in a few minutes from now? Like, it's going to be used. It's heavily accessed memory that you don't want to pull out of memory, but you don't want it in memory. So it's kind of like the, you know, the kind of like the sidebar. Just stick it over there for a second, and I know where it is. Pull it back in. The bigger your cache, the harder it is to find something in the cache, and then the slower it is to actually resolve where it should go. Because then you got to go through the cache to say, well, should I put it here or should I put it over there? Because somebody has to, the memory management routine has to decide where it's going and why it's going there. So there's a little different techniques. Generally, a good, you know, small size cache makes the system run faster because the speed of going and back and forth between the cache is going to be much faster than going back and forth between a backing store if you're going to fill up your virtual memory. So, given that you're going to fill up your virtual memory, you never fill up your virtual memory, you'll never use your cache. Uh, you're going to fill up your virtual memory. <laughs> your operating system is going to have it pretty much filled by the time the user mode even starts. So, All right, so a separation of the logical memory from the physical memory. Only part of the program needs to be in memory for execution, which is actually kind of the funny thing is we think we have the whole program in. We don't. We only have the parts that, need, that we need to run. And so the logical address space can therefore be much larger than the physical address space. So again, taking the abstraction of, uh, you know, I say doubling or tripling. Um, I don't really know what they're doing these days. I would say it's almost bigger than that, actually. So you're making the abstraction of there being more memory than there really is installed on the computer. Virtual memory can be implemented via demand paging and also demand segmentation. So demand segmentation means 
if we have that DLL library and we're using it, then load it up. If it's already there, don't load it, and then link to the segment. So it can use a segmentation concept. So here's the virtual memory that is much larger than the physical memory. I like actually like this slide because it gives us um, gives us a better abstraction here because it gives us all three. So here is the uh, virtual memory. It's huge. Now it's supposed to look like it's huge, and then we have the physical memory, which is you know less probably bigger than half according to this picture. And then we have the logical memory mapping that creates this virtual memory. All of this is really categorized as main memory, however. This is main memory. It's just a virtual abstraction of it. And this is the backing store over here. This is a part of the hard drive that's formatted to look like the virtual memory. <laughs> because we, when we fill this up, we need to put it somewhere. So we put it over here. Uh, even when we shut the computer off, however, we don't have it over here anymore. That gets zeroed out. So it doesn't save it long term. Uh, they could but it doesn't, doesn't use it, so it's just for the runtime environment. So here's our virtual address space with our process, and maybe you've seen this before, this is the runtime run time environment. I usually put the heap up here and a stack down here, but they do grow into each other. This is the space that's allocated per process on the running system. So we take this space and we put it out here, and then when we put it out here, then the process uses it, and then another process starts and then we take it back to the backing store, move it out, and we filled up the memory. So we have these page replacements that happen. So here's our shared memory library using a virtual memory. So we might have this segment out here some, with some shared pages in it, and we're going to map, uh, here's process one and process two, that all are mapped to the same shared library location. So inside of their process space, the page that includes this shared page is actually part of the mapping scheme for both processes. This is why people like shared libraries. This is why those DLLs are very popular and SOs are very popular. So uh, Windows system is called a DLL for a dynamically linked library and on a Windows, excuse me, on a Unix Linux system it's called an SO for shared object. It's the same concept implemented slightly differently what we're looking at is loading that object once. So it supports a segmentation concept. Loading the object once in memory, and then in a, in a paging scheme in terms of a DLL, the process memory is actually mapped to there. So it's, it's not only loaded once, but it's also shared, so, which is the same concept we get on the Unix system. Where there might be a memory address in here that's mapped that goes out to another location. Or it might actually be part of the abstraction, because this is all an abstraction, by the way. So, so as, this, as this looks, it's the runtime for two processes. And what we're looking at is the mapping that has occurred through the page table. So the pages in here are allocated for the process to give us the abstraction of the memory that the process is using. Well. A long time, long time ago, the people just used to pre-map everything. And when you pre-mapped everything, when you <coughs> opened up the program, it was all given. It was all allocated. Well, what if you don't need it? Well, then you have to pull it out. So it's too slow to pre-map it, put it all out into memory, and then fill it all up, fill all the memory up, and then pull stuff out of memory on the, each new program that you put in. So then along came this concept of, well, what if we just do it on demand? So everything is done on demand. Demand segmentation, demand paging. Everything is done when we need it. Even DLLs aren't loaded, which is actually kind of funny because people spend a lot of time tweaking their registry and tweaking what libraries are getting loaded and stuff. And the funny thing is, is it won't get loaded <laughs> unless it's needed. You can have as many DLL files, you can have as many mapping to everything, as much stuff installed on your, it's just like installing programs on your computer. Unless you're loading it, it's not really eating up any resources. It's not taking up any memory, which is how your the concept of demand paging is working. So it's kind of like just in time. I mean, whenever you need it, whenever the operating system thinks it needs it, it lo it will load it. And then in demand paging, it can say, well, if it's already loaded, don't load it again. So you already have this loaded. Why load it up twice? Don't just link to the existing loaded copy. 
So we have more efficient use of the memory. We have less loaded at the beginning. Makes the programs run faster. Makes them start up faster, too. So bring a page into memory only when it's needed. And when we're doing that, then we have to go search through the memory and see if it's there. So response time is a bit slower, but it's not so bad. We can't, it's, it's still faster than loading everything up and then having to unload to make room for something new. So it uses uh, less I.O. and uh, less memory, and it's faster response than uh, some of the other techniques, and then uh, more users. We can have more programs being added. So the page is needed, then it's referenced. If it's referenced, we have an invalid bit, we abort. If it's not in memory, we bring it into memory. So then we have um, the valid versus the invalid in this concept called a page fault that comes into place. So uh, most operating systems have what's called a lazy swapper. That means we can just leave something in memory. It's like, why take it out of memory until you need to? So a lazy swapper just waits. So it never swaps a page out unless we need the page for something else. So it's going to be in there anyway. So swapping that deals with pages is called a pager. So pager swapper. So nobody ever uses that terminology. So transfers of a page memory to continuous, contiguous disk space. This is the backing store, by the way. Uh, so we have a swap in and a swap out to a backing store from a main memory. And this is formatted the same way as this is formatted. So which is why we put a, actually the thing, same thing happens with what's called a swap drive. Unix, Linux, the old days they called them swap drives. You can turn on swapping, turn on. You can actually do the same thing with Windows. You can create a swap drive, turn it on, turn on swapping, turn off swapping. What does that mean? Well, instead of unloading it, copies it to a swap drive. Depending upon how big the swap drive is, though, it might be longer to load it from a swap drive than it is just to reload it fresh. <laughs> so you could, uh, you know, people go, oh, make a huge, make a huge swap drive. And that's such a good idea because then it's slower. It'll just slow your system down. So there's calculations you can do. I think it's supposed to be half the size of your physical memory. So because you have a gig on there, it should be like, you know, 512 or something like that. It should be smaller. In fact, it's common to see 256 or 512 size swap drives uh, because it's only meant for caching, essentially. I call it caching, but it's not really caching. We have cache memory for caching, but uh, it serves kind of the same purpose. It's one intermediate step taken before it goes back to the hard drive. So here's that virtual, uh, excuse me, the valid versus the invalid bit that I was talking about before. So each page table entry um, there's a valid or an invalid or a, a bit that's associated with it. What does that mean? Because we have lazy swapping going on, we have something in the memory, but we don't know if the what's in the memory is good. If we've swapped it, we make it invalid. When we the process wasn't using this page, we decided to allocate the page to somebody else. We picked a victim, and you're it. You're the one that's not being used. So they can use a least recently used algorithm and say, okay, you're not used. So we're going to pull you out of memory. Well, then for the process, we're going to change the bit to invalid. Because when we go back loaded back up again, we have to remember, oh, we just put you back to where you were before. So you're invalid. Was that It causes a page fault. Page fault is basically says what's there is not good. We have to go look for it. We have to go load it in. So then the instruction starts all over again once the page is actually loaded correctly. So people think a page fault is an error. It really isn't. It's just the terminology used to go resolve and make it back to valid. <laughs> switch, the ba switch the bit from invalid to valid. Load what's supposed to be there. Put it back. So, oh, We have attendance. So let me pause this for a second. OK, I was talking about the valid and the invalid bit. We put this on the page table. It's hard to, look, it's hard to kind of imagine this, but this is an actual page table abstraction. So we have a V or an I. We don't really have a V or an I. It's usually an on or an off bit that says whether or not the page is actually belonging to the current process or does it belong to something else and we reused it, essentially. So during the uh, address translation, if the, if the valid or invalid bit in the page table entry is made and it's I, then we have a page fault. So I know how to get everybody's attention back. On the final exam, I'm going to ask you about a page fault. <laughs> okay, now I have everybody listening again. 
H page fault, by definition, is not an error. It is in a condition which, in which the page has been swapped out and the bit is set to I, invalid. So a page table, when some of the pages are not in memory, you get a page fault. They're not in memory because not, it wasn't an error. It was because another, another process needed to use that page. So in a page table configuration, we have pages that are mapped to, well, we have frames inside of pages, pages that are mapped to processes. We only have so much amount of this, we reuse it. So we pulled something out of memory so that another process could use that page. We marked the page as invalid for the process that originally was using it. The original process is now running again. We come back in, we look at it, and it says, I, that's a page fault. What does that mean? It has to go back out, find where did that information go, change the I to a V, make it valid, and then recover and start the instruction over again. So in a page fault, we have to basically, we hit an I, means it's invalid. We have to go to the backing store, find out where it is, how what happened to it, bring it back into memory so that we can... Uh, you know, use it and continue. So. so here's the abstraction of the valid and the invalid bit. Here's the page table. Those are in the page table. And in here are the frames, and then the frames are mapped. So we have the physical memory that's mapped to the logical, and we have all of the information stored in here. And it's just a matter of keeping track what's valid and what's invalid. So. so here's the textbook definition of a page fault. Let's see if this makes any sense. If there is a reference to a page the first reference so that the page will trap to the operating system. Hey, it's a page fault. Mm, I like mine better. So a trap is a software level interrupt. Software level interrupt basically says, let's go to the operating system and find that memory. Where did that memory go? It's an I bit set. It's invalid. We have to go find it. So operating system looks at another table to decide, is there an invalid reference if there is a board? If not, just it's not in memory, or does it need to be in memory? If it's just not in memory, go load it, put it up into memory. It doesn't actually have to put it in the same location, because the same location might be used by another process. So imagine a bunch of pages that were defined, and the pages have all the stuff inside of them, and some processes are using these pages. What if the page is still being used, but it's just doesn't, it's not, it's not being used by this current process that needs to use the memory? Well, then you find another page, load it inside of another page, map that other page to the process. Uh, so get the empty frame, swap the page into the frame, reset the table, set the, the bit now to V for valid, and then restart the instruction that caused the page fault. So basically a page fault exists when something needs to be in memory, but it's not. It was swapped out. So the bit's invalid, so it has to go find it. So here's the restarting the instruction. I don't incrementing the location, perhaps. Here's the steps in handling a page fault. So I'm going to walk you through this a little bit here. So we start with number one. There's a reference. We go in and we say, oh, look, it's I. It's invalid. So we send a software level interrupted trap on number two to the operating system. We go to the operating system. We say, where is this thing? It's on the backing store. Uh, okay, so in step number three, the page is on the backing store. Go find it. It's on the backing store. Okay, so we get it from the backing store. And then in number four, we bring it up and we put it in. We bring it up and we put it into a new page. So we find a free frame from our physical memory. We load it in, up in there. And then we reset the page table to include the correct frame that we have in the correct location where we put the new piece of information. And we change the I to a V and we start the instruction all over again. Not so bad. That's page fault. You know how many people miss that question? <laughs> Everybody misses the question. I'm sorry? Are you going to ask me answer the question? How many people? Fifteen. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> A page fault occurs when we start an instruction and we go to the page table and we've, we've noticed that what we need is not there. It's not there for two reasons. Either it wasn't ever loaded or it was loaded and then it was unloaded because somebody else used my page when I was gone. And so the, the bit was changed to an I. If it's not loaded, we just load it. 
if it, we have an I, that means it was loaded, it's probably on the backing store. So then we initiate a trap to talk to the operating system to go out to the backing store, find the piece of information, take the information, load it back up into a memory location, and then update the page table to reflect that now it's loaded. So that's actually, and it's hard to describe to define a page fault without thinking about, well, what does it do? So it's not an error, it's not a problem situation, it doesn't get caused by corrupted memory. What causes a page fault? The system does it. It's a normal thing. It's when we need to reuse the memory because we don't have enough virtual memory to go around. If we had enough memory for every single program to run simultaneously and everything's loaded up simultaneously, maybe if we had like maybe 30 gigs of RAM or something on there, maybe in the future we'll have that actually. If we have like maybe 30 gigs or something like that, and then we never have to swap anything, never have to take anything out, never have to share anything, we'll never have a page fault. <laughs> so a page fault is not an out. Of, so so what I'll do on the exam, by the way. So for those people who came in a little bit later, we have the exam. It's on two days. It's on the nineteenth. Now that I have everybody's attention, <laughs> we have the exam on the nineteenth on Monday. Next week I will be reviewing for it on the twelfth. We also have an opportunity to take it on the morning of the twenty-first. I'll have the dates for you soon. What I'm going to ask you on this is multiple choice questions. And the multiple choice question is going to say something like, a page fault is, and it'll say, out of memory error, or you know, similar to an out of memory error or something, or it'll be, uh, when something's not loaded up into memory and a process requests the page and it's invalid. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that one's good. Or number C, uh, when the system has run out of memory, no. Or D, none of the above. Or E, all of the above. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's concept-wise. So nothing on any particular operating system, but on vocabulary words. Example, page tables. Page tables hold what? A, they hold the location of the pages that belong to, they, they have a, the frames that belong to the pages, and they're mapped to the current process. Or you know, B, blah, 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 C, blah, blah, blah. Or a, a uh, logical memory is the same as virtual memory because, or logical memory differs from virtual memory because, or logical memory is A, B, C. Virtual memory is A, B, C. <laughs> a thread and a process are the same thing. True or false, you know. Actually, that's a good question. Are threads and processes the same thing? Yeah, if you memorize the definition out of the book, they say a thread is a lightweight process. It is. It's the same thing, though, isn't it? It's just a lighter weight process. Threads belong in, threads get created inside of processes. Programs are threads, excuse me, programs are processes. The user thinks about processes. The kernel thinks about threads. It runs processes in the form of kernel level thread abstractions. So that concept is also on the midterm, uh, on the final exam as well. So, uh, so let's see, performance of demand paging. So we have paging and we have page faults. And then we have demand paging. Well, yeah, it, if we have a high level of page faults, Demand paging efficiency goes down. Why is that? Because we got to start it over again. We want to reduce the number of page faults. How do we reduce the number of page faults? By keeping a better, ab better abstraction of our free frames so we try not to reuse something. Or to pick better victims. So a page fault happens because there was a victim. And a victim is a page that was loaded that was unloaded. So if we got to pick something Let's be wise about it. Let's pick something that hasn't been used that often. So then, when, how, well, how are we going to know what hasn't been used often? Well, then we've got to keep track of hits, page hits, hey, and then hit counts. How often are we using this piece, this piece, and this piece? It's kind of like how people have to pick, you know, well, I have to get rid of something. Well, I haven't used that one in a while. I haven't used that one. And then you have to think about each one of these items that you're going to select from <clears throat> to pick one that you want to use as a victim. Here, you can use this one. Here, we'll get rid of this one. Uh, so if you don't pick your victims correctly, you have a higher level of page faults. A higher level of page faults, the lower level of demand paging can occur. 
because there's no longer demand anymore. Now it's loaded up from scratch, loaded up from scratch. So it basically reduces your efficiency. So it's also measured, uh, so we can have a page fault rate, which is the number of page faults that are happening. And then we have the effective access rate, which is uh, how many times have we go to find something, how fast is it? So effective access rate has to keep into not only the speed of accessing the memory, but also swapping in, swapping out, and page faults. That decreases the effective rate. Because if we said, well, we can read this at some, some such and such speed, it doesn't really matter. If we're reading it, we're not finding what we want, then we're going to slow the system down by all the swapping in, swapping out, and page faults that are going to occur. So we have restart overhead as well, in terms of having to go back in and restart the process. The restart overhead, by the way, actually is partly due to CPU scheduling. CPU scheduler comes in and says, okay, process, you can run now. It's your turn. But what if we hit a page fault? Oh. <laughs> we have it all loaded in, but that's it. That's all you get. Our time ran out. So we go back into the queue, and then we go back. Okay, now we're ready to run. Hopefully we haven't been swapped out. Because if we've been swapped out, then that's going to lead to thrashing. Because what ends up happening is uh, one process gets the run. It runs. It swaps back in when it needs. Up, oh, time's up. Another process runs. It's using the same memory. It says, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so it swaps out. Swaps back in when it needs. The next process runs again. They're all, all they're doing is swapping memory in and out. They're not doing anything. That's thrashing. When they're sitting there swapping. The memory's constantly being swapped by all these processes because we don't have enough memory. And they're all using the same pages. So it's either a bad memory algorithm or it's too, not enough memory on the system. And then we end up in a situation where nothing's being run. Instead, the memory's just being swapped in and swapped out constantly over and over again. So the band paging example here, and we don't have to calculate this on the final exam, but if you were taking a look at this, if you wanted to come up with the effective access rate, well, then we have to take in the memory access time along with the average number of page faults that are going to occur, how much time does it take to recover from the page faults, how much time does it take to swap in and swap out a page? And then we have our effective rate, long bottom line. And then here we have, this is it. In this calculation that you're looking at, there's a slowdown factor, which means because of the page faults and because of the swapping, the system is being slowed down by a certain amount of time. So bottom line, as a user, what does this tell you? Don't double click on it unless you're going to use it. <laughs> Why load something in the memory just to have your memory manager swap it in, swap it out, swap it in, swap it out? Just don't load it. Believe it or not, users actually have experienced that, so users will actually uh, minimize. They'll do their own demand execution. If, unless you're going to use it, don't load it up into memory. Because if I'm not going to use Word, am I gonna really going to load it up into memory right now? Nope. But um, then I'm going to use Word later, then I'll load it up into memory if I'm going to use it. So the, more, the fewer programs you run, the faster your programs run on average because there's less swapping. And that's actually true no matter how much memory you have on that system or how fast your memory is. So in our process creation, the virtual memory allows other benefits. So we have copy and write memory mapped files. I'm not going to get into memory mapped files, but let me just take a look, a look here on this copy and write. So copy and write allows both the parent and the child process to initially share the same pages in memory. As I was mentioning before, that's where we, when we spawn off threads, and we have child threads that are belong to the same process, they get a copy of the parent's memory space. So if either process modifies it, only when the page is copied do we actually need to do anything. It can just stay there. So if you do a copy on and write, then we don't have to do anything until something is written. Then we copy it. If it's already on the backing store and we haven't changed it yet, why, why, and we're going to swap it out, just get rid of it. So it makes it faster. So if we use a copy on write, it means only if it's changed. So copy on write allows more efficient process creation and only modifies pages that are copied as well. So if they're not going to copy it, we don't have to modify the page either. So free pages are allocated from a pool of zeroed out pages instead. So before process one modifies page C, we have process one, process two, and we have the physical memory that's being used. And then after 
Well, this this slide again doesn't really this this example is the same. This picture is the same, so it's not really showing you anything. But after it, nothing happens, it's, like, it's exactly the same. So what does that mean? It means we're not going to touch it. We're not going to do anything with it unless we write to it. Until excuse me, unless we copy it out. If we don't copy it out, we don't need to do anything with it. So what happens is if there's no free frame, no free frames available, the entire system is filled up. That's when we pick the victim. <laughs> we have to make a free frame. So we have what's called a page replacement algorithm. So we find some page in memory, but really in use, but not really in use. It's just out there, but not, not really in use. And then we swap it out. So we pull something good out of memory. So that's called page. So for those people who are interested in a definition of what a page replacement algorithm is, which is also a question you're going to see on the final exam, page replacement means that we're going to look for something and we, we have run out of free frames. Page replacement will not happen if we have free frames. If we have free frames, we should use the free frames. When the free frame count is zero, a page replacement algorithm will pick a victim from memory. Something that's good, something that's being used, something we have loaded, and swap it out. Hopefully it's a fair one. Hopefully it's going to use some algorithm. What are the algorithms? Well, the most popular algorithm is the recently, re, least recently used, which is going to require some aging calculation. How are we going to figure out if this one hasn't been used that often? <laughs> so we have to keep some time or some, some information to keep track of that. And we're interested in the performance. So we want an algorithm that will result in the minimum number of page faults. We want to minimize page faults. Page faults will happen. It will definitely happen. We can't stop page faults. Page faults are not a bad thing. They're actually a good thing. It tells us we need to load something into memory. However, we want to minimize it because it's time consuming. The same page may be brought back into memory several different times during its execution. We want to minimize the number of times it actually gets brought back in. So page replacement. You prevent the over allocation of memory by modifying page fault service routine to include page replacement. So it's another algorithm. It's a set of algorithms that you put in there. This is where you're getting the dirty bit. So you use a modified, or they call it a dirty, because it's changed. So it's modified bit or dirty bit to reduce the overhead of page transfers. Only modified pages are written to disk. So if the disk has changed, excuse me, if the contents have changed, it's dirty. If it hasn't changed, it's not dirty. <laughs> Which means we don't have to clean it up. <laughs> Which is why I say dirty, because you have to clean it up. How do you clean it up? You modify what's on the backing store to match what's in memory. So you have to copy it over. You don't have to copy it over. Don't copy it over. Don't worry, don't worry about it. So page replacement completes the separation between the logical memory and the physical memory. So large virtual memory can provide can be provided on a very small physical memory platform. So Page replacement is definitely needed to provide this kind of abstraction. Otherwise, if we have a lot of memory and it's mapped to only itsy bitsy little pieces of physical, then uh, we have to be able to replace those physical pages. If we can't replace those physical pages, then we can't have this abstraction. So page replacement bridges the gap between virtual memory and physical memory because it's what's creating the possibility of there being more physical spaces than which actually exist. What students often fail to realize is that in order for something to run, it actually has to be loaded into a physical memory address. <laughs> if we only have five physical memory addresses and we have ten virtual memory addresses, we're going to have to do page replacement. Page replacement swaps out what's physically loaded. So if it's in the five, we have five, we have to share it among ten people. At any one moment of time, only five things are going to be running, five things are going to be loaded, which is why we still want a lot of physical memory. But we're going to make more out of it even after we put the physical memory on there. So if we had ten, then that would be a better match. So operating systems tell you how much memory you're supposed to have at a minimum. It needs a certain amount in order to make efficient use of it from a virtual abstraction. It's not just using the 10 spaces, though, or the 5 spaces. It's using the virtual abstraction of that, which is doubling or tripling it. So, 
So page replacement takes what's physically stored in the memory, because this is a memory as a resource. We need the physical resource to actually run it. Otherwise, we can't store anything. <laughs> so we read it from a physical abstraction, from a physical memory. We write it to a hard disk, because that's what the swapping, that's what the backing store is. This is our hard drive. We actually physically write it to a hard drive so that we can save it. Well, are we going to use it past when we turn the computer off? No. But we're going to use it while the computer's turned on because we're going to take whatever's in the physical memory, pull it out, and load the other one back in because we keep having to swap it back and forth. We're swapping. Swapping is required because we only have a small amount of physical memory and we have much more virtual memory. So we're using more than we actually have. It's kind of like overdraft protection. <laughs> if you spend more money that's in your account, your overdraft kicks in, hopefully, if you have overdraft protection. And that covers everything, and then you have a negative balance. Operating systems constantly run at a negative balance, and the backing store is the overdraft. We're constantly moving things back and forth so that we can um, juggle the, court, the, the relationships between everything. So page replacement algorithms come into place. So we find the location of the desired page on the disk. We find three. We find the free frame. So if there is no free frame, then uh, we do the page replacement. If there is one, we just use it. There's no need to do page replacement if there's a free frame. If there's nothing, then we have to pick a victim. So we call it a victim frame because it's the one we're hoping we're not going to have to load back in. We're hoping it's just going to be one that we don't use very much. So we bring the desired page into the newly free frame that we just created, and then we run, and we update the frame buffer, the frame table. And then we restart the process. So page replacement is very similar to a page fault, but it is a different process. It is a different process because it deals with loading something in that's not loaded. So it pulls something from memory and puts it into the physical memory address space. So it's coming from a backing store. It's coming from another location. So here's a page replacement algorithm where we pick the victim. So in number one, we swapped out the victim page. And then number two, we changed the bid over here, made it valid. And then we took from a swapped out page and we put it back into memory. So number three brought it back in. So, so page replacement swaps out what's actually physically loaded, replaces it with a, something that needs to be run. We're not going to do any page replacement unless we need to. So these are lazy as well. So lazy swappers, lazy page, on-demand paging is what it's called. So we're doing page replacement on demand. We're not going to swap it out if we don't need to swap it out. It takes up, eats up too much CPU cycles. So here's a page replacement algorithm. We want the lowest number of page faults. So just how we have continuous memory allocation algorithms, we have algorithms and schemes and CPU algorithms. Scheduling algorithms, we have page replacement algorithms. <sighs> Lucky for you, you don't have to implement any of these in your assignments. However, what we're looking for is a technique to reduce the number of page faults. So you evaluate the algorithm by running it on a particular memory stream. Here's our memory string. So this is just a bunch of strings of numbers that we need to load up. So if we look at this, and we'll go through a couple of different scenarios here. Here's a graph of the page faults versus the number of frames. You could possibly see how, as the number of frames increase, the number of page faults goes down, which means the more memory we have, the fewer number of page faults we're going to have because everything's going to be loaded. Not enough frames, higher number of page faults, more swapping. That's why we have to put on at least the minimum amount of memory that the operating system is going to want. Otherwise, we're going to get too much swapping. If we get too much swapping, nothing's going to run. Actually, this is really easy to tell. You know, you get a Windows computer, just pull out one of your banks of memory, and then you can see how the swapping works. Your hard drive will constantly be running and be like, what's going on here? The system will just run too slow, but things will be happening. The whole thing is working really hard, but it's just thrashing. And thrashing is when it's reading it in, taking it out, reading it in, taking it out, reading it in, because it can't, doesn't have enough. So here's the first in, first out algorithm. Well, we take it in order. So here's the reference stream. We have three frames. Not enough, actually. 
So the three pages are in memory at a time per process. So only three memory, only three. So we have one, two, three. So one, two, three is loaded. And then we have nine page faults that occur because we need, we have uh, all the rest of this list to put in, but we can only hold three. So we have nine times we have to go back and load something, put something back in, unload something, put something back in. Or if we had four frames, as it what we've got here, we reduce the number of page faults by one because now we can have more memory that's been allocated. So a first come first serve loads in essentially everything in order, fills up the frames, unloads the frames, fills up the frames, unloads the frames. We count up the number of page faults. We want to reduce the number of page faults. So the algorithm holds true with the more number of frames that we have, the fewer number of page faults. If we wanted to make this very efficient, we'd have nine frames. <laughs> then we could load up the entire string all at one time. So if we picked how on, on average how many frames we needed, then we can optimize the operating system so that your average program doesn't have to swap. So we can bring, because the, the ideal is to load one program at a time, have that loaded at least. So the whole program gets put into memory and there's no swapping. Then we knew how much memory do we need. That's where they come up with this two gigs, three gigs, to load one program at a time. You're going to need so much amount of RAM so that you don't have any swapping that goes on and no page replacements. So everything gets loaded up at one time. So this is the, uh, this is the, the kind of the, the scenario that we're working with. In this anomaly here, uh, we've caused more page frames. So if we look at the concept here, and I'll just go down here to the illustration. The number of frames with the number of page faults, the page faults goes down with a higher number of frames. So it's, it's kind of a no-brainer to kind of think of that, actually. So it's a fairly easy. Then we can have an optimal algorithm where we take a page replacement uh, and we think about, well, let's just not replace the first ones. So replace the page that will not cause the longest period of, that, that hasn't been used for the longest period of time. So if we have to replace a frame and we have this program that we loaded an hour ago and it's just been sitting minimized for all this time, that's the one that's going to be unloaded. So it will definitely be unloaded. And then when it gets unloaded, because it's basically a least recently used optimized algorithmic approach, then we can put the brand new program, we can just replace that entire program, take it out of memory, and put a brand new program into memory. Only problem is when we switch back to that program, eventually, that's when the waiting screen comes up. <laughs> if you wait long enough, the program will reload itself but it's loading it from a backing store, which is slower than loading it from the hard drive. So in a perfect world, the operating system would tell us, hey, just unload that program. Do you really need this program running right now? I need to use all of its memory space. If the user just unloaded it, and then, uh, or the operating system just unloaded it completely, just took it out of memory, it would run faster the second time you brought it back up, or the third time, or whatever. Uh, why, are you having, why, is, why is it running? It doesn't need to be running. So long story short, the uh, user has noticed that and you as a, your user behavior actually has changed. So you're not doing as much multi-programming or multi-processing as you probably have been doing in the past, only because you've learned, don't load it unless you're going to use it. Because <laughs> then if you do, it's going to take longer for it to run in the future. Anyway, so uh, you pick out a victim. So how do you do this? You have, well, you have to measure how long it's been sitting there. So you put an aging calculation on it, so you know. This is called the least recently used algorithm, which means the last one that hasn't been used, and we found that these fives and this four over here, colored ones, haven't been used that often. And we use those as victims. With the assumption that if you're not using it, then you may not want to use it. So we can really slow down the loading of that in the future on the assumption that the user may not ever even load that up again. So it makes everything else that you you are using run faster. So. so if we apply that as a page replacement algorithm, then, then we can have something that, uh, I'm not really going through the comparisons, but we get a faster running algorithm. So we can have a stack implementation of the least recently used algorithm instead of keeping a counter. So if we keep an aging counter, how often the 
the frame actually has been used, then we have overhead. If we organize the memory in sort of a stack configuration, then we don't have to count it. We just, it's on the bottom. We just pull it off the bottom. So if we loaded up a stack and we keep using the top of the stack and we keep using that and we have something on the bottom, we can basically just say, well, we'll just replace it. We'll just go down further. And then we'll end up automatically generating the least recently used rather than having to calculate it. So keep a stack of pages in a doubly linked list and go the opposite direction. So in terms of the page reference for, well, move it to the top requires six pointers to be changed. So no search for the replacement. We just pull it off the top, pull it off the top. So we can essentially take the last one that hasn't really been used. So if we implement using a stack, we take away the overhead of the algorithm and we make it run faster, long story short. So then we can also use a reference bit as well with this. So with each page associated with a bit, initially zero, when a page is referenced, the bit's set to one. So we can keep track of a, from a bit perspective. So when I'm going through our different techniques, by the way, of figuring out which one was the recently, rec least recently used, because we have to come up with an algorithm that's going to basically give us this information. So the bit is very promising, which means, you know, if the bit's been changed, then it's been used. If it hasn't been changed, then it hasn't been used. The stack is actually kind of promising as well. And the only one that's not really promising is the algorithm that runs constantly to reorganize everything or constantly to check on something. So we also have a, a second chance bit needed for a reference, and it might be a clock replacement, which means after a certain amount of time, we're going to change the bit. And then maybe we'll give it a second chance. If you use it, we're going to change it back. So it's kind of like saying, well, confirmation. We've made this reservation, <laughs> and we're going to confirm now. That's the second chance. Do you want to confirm, or do you want to cancel? And so you cancel it as a, you know, because you're not going to use the bit. You're not going to use the frame. So. Here's our second chance clock on a page replacement that's going to go through and give us the next victim and then the next victim and then the next victim, depending upon how we're going to orchestrate this. As I mentioned before, we might have counting algorithms, and a counting algorithm is going to count up, keep a counter for the number of references. Um, you might actually kind of consider that these techniques are very similar to garbage collection, because garbage collection is going to use the same thing. It takes the re most recently not used if it has to pull something out of memory, a garbage collector is going to pull something that hasn't been used, the least recently used piece of memory. And it's also going to keep track of references. So reference counters are sort of like counting algorithms. They keep track of memory addresses. Is this process using this memory address? Is that one using it? Changes the reference counter to zero. When it goes needs memory, lazy garbage collectors will leave it up there, change the bit, and then when it needs a piece of memory, okay, where are you? Here's an empty one. Here's one that's not being used and picks that as a victim. So, so you might think that the uh, memory management algorithms are very similar to garbage collectors because the concept is actually very similar. They're looking for garbage, but it's not garbage. It's memory that the user is using, but they're not using all of the memory. So in essence, we're, we're basically pulling stuff out of memory and we're collecting and reclaiming memory that the user still thinks they're using which means we have the extra overhead of restoring it when we have to. But in the meantime, we can just use it. So, All right, so the allocation of frames can be done automatically. It can also be a fixed allocation scheme where we're going to fix and have an equal allocation, so many frames per page. Um, you don't have to know all the different examples of all the different techniques for doing frames. Mm -hmm. But we have to come up with, if we're an operating system developer, we also have to figure out how we're going to allocate our frames to those pages. Because remember, pages are an abstraction of a certain number of frames. So in a fixed allocation, they're all going to get the same amount. On a priority allocation, higher priority processes are going to get more frames, essentially. So we're going to use proportional allotment schemes using priorities rather than size. So how much does something need? We can also use it by need base as well. So we can select a replacement one for its frames and then select replacement uh, for the process with lower priorities. We also have global versus local allocation to think of. 
In a global replacement scheme, the process selects a replacement frame from a set of all frames in the entire system. One process can be from any, any number of, of users or any number of people. In a local, it's only a set of allocated frames for the particular user or for the particular, um, for the particular environment. What does that mean? Well, in a client server distributed computing environment, you might be using frames that another user is not using. The secretary is out to lunch, and her system is um, their system still up and running. It's going to be running all the time. She's using a Unix box, but she's not running any programs. She has stuff loaded in memory, but she's not using it. So let's go use it. <laughs> so in the global allocation scheme, it's going to use all of the memory of the system, not just what's been assigned for each user or for which each terminal or for each station. So it's basically looking at the localization. And here's that word thrashing I was talking about before. Thrashing occurs when we're constantly loading and unloading. So if a process does not have enough pages and the page fault rate is very high, it leads to a very low CPU utilization. If you remember CPU scheduling, very low level of utilization because nothing's being run. Uh, but the operating system thinks that it needs to increase the degree of multiprogramming. So the schedules are actually running really fast. The schedulers are constantly running. So another process is added to the system, everything is going in, everything is going out, swapping is going on. Thrashing is a process of a busy swapping pages in and out, but no work is actually being done. So thrashing leads to low CPU utilization. <laughs> An important concept to remember as well. And here's our level. So it thinks it needs to increase the level or the degree of multiprogramming. The CPU is tricked into thinking it needs to do this, so that's why it continues to do it, but it never gets enough pages, never free pages. It can't load everything it needs to load because you're trying to load too much. So, And the CPU utilization comes up to the thrashing point, and then essentially it drops because the CPU just isn't being utilized at that point. It can't be. It's busy thrashing. thrashing. So demand paging and thrashing, why does demand paging work? Well, from a locality model, process migrates from one locality to another. Locality may overlap, but you can take advantage of, um, you know, of different pages that are loaded or not loaded. Why does thrashing occur? Well, the size of locality is larger than the total memory size. We only have five pages, but we need 20. Then we're going to have a problem with that, and we're going to thrash. So to eliminate the need for thrashing, you add more memory to the system. Or you increase the locality, make it global. If you make it global, then you're using all the memory on the system. And if that's the case, you're not hopefully not going to be not going to be thrashing. So most of the most of the memory allocation schemes on multi multi use multi multi user systems are global strategies. You're not going to organize the memory per user. What does that mean? It means you might be using memory that another user is actually using and you're sharing the memory among different users. You're doing that in a Unix system, you're doing it on a distributed system. On a Windows system, you're going to get one user account is going to have access to all memory. All users are going to have access to all memory. So if you switch the users, you don't normally have more than one user logged in simultaneously. So you have a global, but it's really your local. So don't need to know the working set. I'm going to skip through that. Don't need to keep track of the working set model. So, and we don't need to know about memory mapping files either, but you can essentially probably already know this that everything all files are buffered. So we have but files that are the abstraction of reading a file from a hard disk, you're not going to read and write to that secondary storage. Instead, you're going to map the file to memory using a file pointer. So if you've done this with opened up files in C or C++ before, you have a file pointer. The pointer is a memory address where the file has been loaded up into, and then you're reading and writing to the memory address, so, which is meant by memory mapped files, and which is essentially very similar in concept as running programs in memory. You're just accessing memory that's mapped to a file abstraction. You also have memory mapped files on a hard drive, too, because the hard drive bits are all over the place, and it's mapped to the abstraction of a file, and the file could be taking up so many number of bits, so, which is another concept here, memory mapped files. So.
Don't need to know about the operating system implementations either, so I will skip through that. So this chapter, actually, you only have to know the definitions in the beginning part of it, because you don't have to know about the operating system examples. A lot of these are outdated as well. So, Believe it or not, that's all you needed to know out of Chapter 9 on the book as well, which is virtual memory. See, virtual memory is very similar to main memory in terms of the concept. It's just making more use of main memory. It's making that main memory and tripling it, you know, using page replacement and swapping and dirty bits, and, you know, page faults as a concept too, and which is what's covered in this chapter. So, Questions about virtual memory? I feel like I went through it kind of fast, but uh, you guys look kind of antsy like you want to go, so. No? Okay, then we're done for today. Next week we will have the second, we'll have two, twofold. Next week will be the review for the final. I'll bring the final in with me and I'll tell you what to study for it. I'll do that in the second part of the class. In the first part of the class, I'll finish up with any concluding lectures that we might have. So, so we'll have a full class time, but only the second part of it will be, because most people sometimes arrive a little bit later. So I'll save the final <laughs> exam review for the second part. And uh, keep working on those assignments. They're due, I believe, on the 22nd, did I say it? 28th? No, 22nd. 22nd. I set the assignment due date for Thursday the 22nd, actually. Now, the 28th is a... It's after the grades are due. So I can't do it on the 28th. So. All right, see you next week.